Uh, we are getting started with the next panel, so please take a seat so that we can get going. Vijay, go ahead. Alright, uh, thank you Narin. Uh, first of all, before we start, I uh, just wanted to uh, send a very, very warm thanks to Narin and the entire organization team, organizing team for bringing this event together after almost three plus years. So Narin, please don't get anywhere, stand there. Thank you and your wonderful team for bringing this together. I never imagined I would thank these many Godav guys in my life. <laughs> Let alone, let alone in one event, but uh, let it be that. Thank you guys for uh, bringing this to me. Uh, I will forgive you for incorrectly mentioning my hostel as Saras instead of Nalu. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so I'm Vijay, Vijay Narayan. I'm currently a fellow and partner at uh, Fellows Fund, a small air focused native fund. We're really looking at uh, early stage investments in data, AI, life sciences, web 3 security, etc. I was earlier, the, uh, most recently, the chief AI officer at a company called ServiceNow, where I led the research, the platform, products, and the strategy of data, AI, and uh, ServiceNow. And earlier than that, I was uh, at Pinterest, where I led the research, science, and engineering for all the core products. Uh, and, I thought the, and, and even before that, I uh, helped build a lot of the data and AI services on Microsoft Azure. The Azure machine learning and the cognitive services. Uh, to my left is uh, Ishwar, Ishwar Bellani. He's a founding partner at the Symphony AI Group, or I think they are now called the Sal Group. Uh, and uh, really driving strategic investments and innovation in more than 1,600 enterprise customers, uh, generating nearly half a billion dollars in annual I think Ishwar held very key positions at Rubrik and uh, Rocket Fuel, where he led a number of uh, high growth initiatives in the early stages. He also founded Synsac Applications and High Leverage, uh, which was later acquired by Epiphany. He has a master's in computer science from Berkeley and of course a BTEC from IIT Chennai. Uh, and uh, beyond his uh, professional interests, I think Ishwar also has a green thumb. And uh, he nurtures plants and he has a certification as an urban horticulturist from the University of California. So welcome Ishwar. Not for Kona. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to Ishwar's left is uh, Srini, Srinivas Narayan, who I think when he introduced for all of us, he recently joined uh, the not so open AI as the uh, EP of engineering a couple of months ago. And he was previously at the much more currently open meta, which is doing a lot more AI open initiatives. Uh, for almost 13 years, where uh, towards the end he led the AI applied research team. And earlier he has led the engineering team for photos and other Facebook products, and also led the platform and applications group at Oculus. Welcome, Srini. More importantly, I am from Bodo. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I'm from Salas and we used to fire rockets at Goda. <laughs> so, to, uh, to Srini's left is Piyush Piyush Rao. He is not from Goda, he is not from any of the IATM hostels because he is from IATP. Oh. And, uh, <laughs> but even so, <laughs> He's an experienced entrepreneur and technologist. He's currently the founder and CEO of uh, Beam AI, a platform that empowers uh, building next generation of enterprise AI solutions using low-code, low-code solutions. Prior, prior to Beam, uh, he was the co-founder and VP of engineering at uh, Citizen, a patient-first healthcare platform that had a successful exit. Uh, uh, led a number of technology leadership roles in several startups. He's also an avid runner and uh, loves being outdoors. And uh, he's an alumni, alumni of YAT Bond. And finally, uh, we have the guy with AI in his name, Girish. Uh, he is the co founder and CEO of Rockfish, a generative AI startup developing a synthetic data workbench for data scientists. He has over a quarter of century experience in the AI, ML, and tech industry. He serves as the CEO and board member of IATM uh, Foundation, the IIT Chennai Foundation. 
He holds a BTEC from Chennai, IIT Chennai, and Masters and PhD from Boston University and MBA from Boston. So welcome guys, it's a very distinguished panel here today. Uh, so as we start, uh, I really wanted to uh, start off with a very uh, decent Vijay, question. Vijay, can I pick up for one minute about Girish? Sure. So Girish and I are having a conversation yesterday uh, on email, and he says, I hope there's going to be DOS AI. <laughs> and my response is no, but they're going to have bad AI. <laughs> okay. So I'm hoping to hear some nice AI jokes from Girish on this panel and outside. So, uh, so in the last almost three decades, every decade has started a very fundamental revolution, right? Started out with computers and the internet, you know, the social, and now. The AI revolution. So, what really makes AI, and more, more specifically, generative AI novel, and, and where do we think it's going to lead to in our professional and personal lives? You should have one. Okay, so, maybe start this. So, you know, before this uh, panel started, we had a discussion outside, and uh, looks like it's a free for all outside of getting physical with each other. We'll, uh, you know, everything is up for grabs. So, we try to make this as provocative as possible. Um, so to, to answer the question, uh, you know, at least my opinion, I think this is the first time we've created a technology that can defy human authority, right? All the technologies that we've created in the past, uh, they were to some degree under uh, human control, uh, but now we have the potential uh, uh, that, you know, uh, it can go out of control. Uh, I, I think of this technology as, you know, modern day alchemy. Uh, and the reason for that is uh, what we've done is we've taken uh, a large amount of data, uh, a large amount of compute, lots of smart people uh, like Srinivas here, and then we've, we've you know, come up with a technology that does remarkable things. So if you had come to me five years earlier and you had told me that, look, we're going to have systems uh, where we don't really necessarily design specific features, but they, the features kind of just emerge in those systems, right? We don't even fully understand all the capabilities the system may have, and uh, we obviously don't understand how uh, it's got all those capabilities. That's what we are dealing with here. Uh, you know, there are emergent properties being discovered with these models on a on a pretty much a weekly basis, uh, and uh, no one talks these systems. Uh, things like common sense reasoning, or physical intuition, or logical deduction or causal judgment, or how to do math, uh, or metacognition, which is the theory of the mind, you know, uh, or, or uh, you know, writing software, or, or invoking services and tools. They just developed these properties. So that's what makes it very novel. That's what makes it very different from what we've had in the past. And it's, it's very fascinating in terms of, uh, you know, where this is going to go, given that we're still only in the very early innings of, of this journey. Okay. Yeah, I can take a crack at it. So, one thing I do see adding to what Ishwar said is, um, number one, you know, we, we had AI do classification and recommendations and all that stuff. But it's just like humans, right? Initially, we go to school, we learn things. And then the next step is we create our stuff. I think in this case, the AI is that part. It's the first phase of creating stuff. And I think that's what makes it fascinating and also very different from what has been done before. And it is a natural evolution if you want to make AI very similar to the human mind, if you want to it. So I think it's phenomenal, the first step, again, just like anything else, when we create the first uh, essay or first article, we never get it right, and that's what we are at this stage, but we are going in a phenomenal direction, and the pace with which we are going is unbelievable. Let me just add one perspective here, right? So AI has been around various shapes and forms for uh, many years now. I think one big change that has happened with uh, the large language models is the API has changed from uh, software terminology to language. I think that has opened up the use of these models by not just us who understand software, but uh, you know consumers can now start. Right? That's what happened with Google when Google came up with search. It just sort of basically uh, democratized the whole access. I think that's one huge change that uh, these models have made. I mean, the techniques have been around for, for some time, and they will keep evolving. Uh, but the uh, natural language API, I think, is, is a big game changer in the uh, 
Having said that, it's natural language is also a little bit unstructured or not unstructured, so we have to be really careful, uh, especially in, in cases where we are using it for serious applications, because natural language can be manipulated and you know, it's not, it can be ambiguous, hence the model will give us back that kind of feature. So you know, just, that's what I would say at this point. Yeah, I mean also the other thing about Naraj is I think for the first time we're seeing signs of truly generalized as, as opposed to uh, task specific intelligence which was the feature of AI until maybe a few years ago. And that basically means the cost to solve a real world problem is just way cheaper and faster than it has ever been before. You have just such a foundational layer that allows you to take that and apply it to anything that you want fairly easily, sometimes with very, very little work or zero work. Um, and that's just amazing to see is that the intelligence is just so generalized and that's amazing. Thank you. So, uh, so obviously in terms of the site, hopefully better emails and better ad copies. And, uh, but it, has there been any real tangible application so far, especially on the enterprise side or something that you think is, uh, hey, this could not have been done at scale? without generating AI, or are we still at the early stages or even at the high stage? Right, so. Yeah, I'll maybe give two examples. I think um, I think it's very transformational. Um, I'll maybe give you two examples. One probably all of us are familiar with is just like, if you're a software engineer and if you're not using any of these uh, co-pilots, you're missing out, right? They, it, uh, and if you look at the current generation of people who are starting to write software, it's fundamentally different. Uh, and you are able to make, do your software way faster, better than we have ever done before. Uh, a second example I would give is so maybe in the legal industry, talking about enterprise software, right? A lot of what humans do is uh, reading documents, summarizing them, right? And now for the first time we have technology that is that allows us to process large volumes of documents and summarize them and write summaries way better than before, right? So that fundamentally changes knowledge work. I'm using legal as one example, but you can basically take that pattern and apply it to every industry, and that is a very fundamental shift. I'll take a real, I can take a real example, just very, very fresh. We just delivered a pilot to a customer, and this relates, to, this is a very real experience for me because in my previous startup where we were building this healthcare data pipeline, where you know, five years ago, large language models were not available to us. We used the traditional and field computer vision techniques. It took us a year and a half to build that pipeline and, you know, to get any sort of really uh, good quality data out of it. And just in the last three weeks, I was able to, using LLMs, uh, develop a pilot for, not for healthcare data, but for a similar, uh, another industry. And the same, of course, I had the knowledge of how to do it, so it, it was, and that advantage, but technically speaking, uh, you know, it was just you know, from one and a half years to three weeks. I mean, that's a huge, huge uh, productivity gain, you know, for the same use case. So I think things are going to be really, really faster to develop, it, you know, with, with the help of these elements. And I think that's going to really enable a lot more. Yeah. And uh, I also want to add to that. Uh, if you look at the flip side, if you're an enterprise and you don't do this. You're going to lose out on a competitive advantage like nobody's business. So the, uh, and most of the enterprises today are thinking in that direction. You have to do this. If you don't do it, somebody else is going to, your competitor is going to do it far better. And that efficiency gain that you could get, whatever that may be, I think today, to your point, it can be much higher today. But um, if you don't do it, you're going to be, you're going to be my top person. Maybe just to add to what Girish just said, uh, you know, there's this uh, very fun movie that came out in the late 90s. It's called Clubber, 98-99. Uh, it's a movie as uh, Robin Williams plays uh, this uh, character of a crazy scientist uh, slash professor uh, in that uh, movie. And he creates, a, he invents a new substance, uh, you know, which is like a gluey, uh, bouncy kind of substance. And so uh, there's one scene in the movie where there's a basketball game going on and this university is losing 0 to 50. You know, halftime score is, uh, the home team is 0. The visiting team is 50, and the visiting team, like they're all these, you know, seven footers who are big, bulky guys who are uh, playing basketball, and then the home team is all the nerds, you know, like five footers, uh, five and a half feet, uh, many people playing basketball. So at halftime, 
what Robert William does is, uh, you know, he uh, applies this uh, flower into to everyone's shoes of the home team, and then he shakes everyone's hands as well. So it comes onto their hands, their shoes, and they 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 don't really know. But when they enter the court after half time, you should see some of the YouTube clips. It just goes crazy. I mean, these guys are jumping 30, 40 feet off the air. They're dribbling the ball, where the other guy can't even see where the ball is because they're dribbling it so fast. So I bring this up as an example of everything that we're creating with Gen AI is the new age flower. And without that, to everything that Karish said, that Shriniwa said, you're not going to be able to compete. And then the game ends where the, you know, the visiting team doesn't make any more baskets and, and these guys score like, got you know, so many baskets and they win. Um, so what's going to happen is, uh, folks are going to, for every role, for every industry, for every function, there's going to be this notion of uh, a co-pilot. There's going to be a spectrum of uh, human engagement with these systems. Uh, there's a notion of co-pilots and autopilots, and there's, there's lots of pilots all over the place, so we're going to see that development uh, happen. And if you don't leverage these tools, uh, you know, you're not going to be competitive in the marketplace. And the other dynamic which we can maybe talk about a little bit later is the impact on companies, and uh, the expectation is that company sizes will shrink, and uh, there's, there's going to be a pretty transformational journey that we'll be going through over the next three to five years. So, so perhaps we can uh, dig into that right? because I think one of the uh, themes just presented in this talk is generative AI is going to both amplify productivity and help people be faster, cheaper, better, but also be creative. Right? So far, we have not really had great tools to amplify human creativity, still being very much in the first few generative AI brings a new dimension of amplifier uh, for people. <coughs> Especially in searching for very large dimensions and uh, things that are going to have to cut scale. Now that the cloud is going to be better. Right. Is this better? Yes. Okay. Uh, so uh, let's actually dig into the next thing that uh, uh, you should have to So uh, along with the option of any new technology comes a whole set of uh, issues, right? And generative AI yeah, obviously has its own set of issues. Whether it's all the way from bias or misinformation or uh, deep trading sort of hallucinations to uh, sometimes even sinister ones like calling out and folks are calling out. Um, and uh, what do you think are going to be some of the challenges, especially as enterprises start adopting this like Flubber before they can universally start applying Flubber? What are some of the precautions, some of the things and safety that they have to think about as they as they start bringing in generative AI into their, their, their stack. Each one you want to start? Sure. Yeah, so uh, I was in a Gartner conference uh, recently uh, on enterprise applications and solutions. This was about two weeks back. And uh, I was in a, in a room full of, uh, you know, CIOs and execs from uh, Fortune, classic Fortune, you know, 500 uh, types that, that come to these conferences. And uh, we were, uh, it was a workshop kind of setting, so I was, I was uh, trying to gauge from them where they are in their uh, you know, adoption or awareness of, of this technology. So uh, what I observed was, uh, based on some of my questions, we are in a bimodal uh, type of distribution right now, where I'd say there is about 10 or 15 percent uh, of the folks that quote unquote who get it, right? They see this as existential and they are like all hands on deck, running 100 miles an hour, uh, you know, trying to stay on this cutting edge, uh, you know, and working with all the latest tools and technologies out there. But the large majority, about 80, 85% of the folks, I was uh, a little surprised because we tend to think about this on a day-to-day -day basis and we are obsessed about it. But uh, by and large out there, uh, folks have uh, you know, many of them are, you know, a little bit of deer in the headlights kind of syndrome. They're still trying to make sense of what is this? Is this another hype cycle of the tech wave? You know, they've seen so many of these. Uh, there are uh, other uh, uh, concerns that have shown up at these enterprises. So, for example, legal teams have really clamped down, right? They shut off access to any of these tools. There are data privacy concerns. Uh, there are uh, intellectual property infringement concerns, you know, the output that I'm getting can actually use it or if I get sued to use that output, uh, will my data be safe? Uh, you know, there's uh, trademark and copyright concerns, you know, was the data that was used to train these models, uh, you know, uh, kosher in some sense. Uh, they've, they've raised a lot of concerns. 
And, uh, and so internally, a lot of these folks are still grappling through what should we be doing, what is our policy, and until they figure some of that out, the majority of the folks are in some sort of suspended action. That's what I gave from two weeks ago. That's where the state of some of these key, you know, uh, the market uh, customers are. And so I'm thinking it's going to take uh, some education, some awareness, some training, uh, you know, some folks to really understand uh, what this means for them. And my, my thinking is that uh, we will see different dynamics across different industries because some industries are regulated, they're going to move at, you know, a, a different pace. Uh, but in other industries where maybe they have more degrees of freedom, uh, you will find some of the innovators uh, starting to uh, really uh, pull away from the pack. And, and that will be, uh, you know, uh, a big inflection point that will uh, really uh, get the laggards and, you know, the, I'll say, uh, the majority of the folks to really get that together and then there's going to be shockwaves. In. So I'm going to, I expect to see this industry by industry in terms of uh, like the pretty uh, dramatic flips from doing nothing to, oh my god, uh, this is something, if we don't get our act together, uh, you know, this could be existential. Yeah, so I'm really interested in uh hearing what you guys are saying from OpenAI as somebody who provides uh, some of these foundational technologies. How do you see enterprises thinking about this thing as they talk to you or when you guys uh, yeah. pitch um, I mean, what Nishwa said resonates. I think there's still a lot of fault in the uh, outside. Some of the fears are are very easily solvable. I think things like data privacy, yeah, absolutely, you know, we're going to have to guarantee that. And unfortunately, there is probably not enough awareness of that. Um, I, I sort of think there's multiple dimensions to it. One, maybe uh, if we just zoom back, one large question we hear often is enterprises often have unique data assets. So how do I leverage that uh, and not just use what is off the shelf, but how do I actually bring my own data into this and make the intelligence better and make, make it more useful for what I'm trying to do? Uh, that I think is probably one sort of very high level theme. We have approaches to doing that. People try to do fine tuning on top of you know, existing language models. I think that is, is a pretty solid use case. I expect the tooling around this to evolve quite a bit. Um, I would say then again, maybe I would categorize enterprise adoption into two buckets, right? One is sort of AI behind the scenes. Um, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to make decisions in an enterprise, I think there's a huge opportunity to just make those decisions smarter, better through applications of AI. I think there's the second part, which is and that's, I think, a very obvious and a simple thing to do. The more interesting part is, can you use this to really transform your business fundamentally, right? And where are those opportunities? And if you just continue doing what you're doing, I think this is not an incremental technology. It is a very disruptive technology. There is somebody who's in your business who's thinking about how to disrupt yourself, right? And so I think the bigger, more interesting question for most businesses is, how do I use this to really fundamentally transform and disrupt myself before somebody else does it to me? And of course, you know, that depends from every business, but that I think is the bigger question everybody should be asking. Okay. Yeah, um, I think uh, fundamentally over the past many years, right, the, the, one of the challenges with AI has been that, uh, I mean, obviously there are 10, 15% companies that have really used it well, you know, uh, in, the, in the past, but for most enterprises, the challenge has been Models are developed, but models are not something that can be business value. And I think that's a that's, that's been a big that's been a big gap in the enterprise where you know you have a data science team, they keep developing models, but then you know the business stakeholders don't see any you know. I think that fundamental gap uh, uh, is still there today, even with the generative AI technologies. Until we start bridging that gap of using an LLM or another foundation model to connect it to the business value. And that, I think, uh, the, the fact that the fundamental technology is now easily accessible will definitely accelerate things. But that last mile of providing business value is still going to be challenging. Because uh, you know these models are obviously not deterministic. And you, know, they, they, you have to learn how to use those models well. Just like when you're dealing with a self-driving car, you need to have a faith in that you know, the, the algorithm that this car will do this and if I let it go. So it's, it's a similar sort of paradigm and I think that's where the uh, majority of the effort in the enterprise is going to go to learn to use these tools uh, to develop business value. Otherwise, you'll just end up with a very cool technology. Yeah. Yeah. Which I also wanted to add, 
touching on what uh, Srinivas said, one of the fundamental problems that enterprises are facing is availability of data. Even though you know, model development base has been incredible, compute ability has been amazing. However, the ability to have the right data that you need to test these have been a big challenge for enterprises uh, you know, even today, even with the generated AI model. And also, in addition, in order to kind of avoid some of the pitfalls, bias, and all the other stuff, you need to have various types of data, amplified, and all kinds of stuff. I think that's that has been a fundamental challenge. And and to what Peter said, I also want to say that uh, the economic decision a company makes to invest in a product or to invest more money in it, that pretty much dictates uh, you know how a technology does and how it does. So you know when people talk about AI is going to destroy things. It's a very unlikely, just like anything else that we've seen in the past, economic aspect automatically trumps everything else, thankfully. So I hope that will be the case here as well. So I think there's less to worry about, but again, we'll see. Well, on the topic of worry, uh, one of the common worries uh, that Jenny engenders is uh, uh, it can replace a large number of uh, human jobs, right? Uh, and uh, I think for the first time, was brought up this example of legal profession, especially the paralegals, or any job that requires some type of research, some type of summarization, some type of analysis, drafting, everything are now starting to get really uh, disrupted using gen gen And uh, the common fear is, hey, will, or will a large swath of these jobs become nothing but fancy prompt engineers? And, uh, so, um, how do you see the jobs of the future in a world of Jenny, I think? And uh, I really like to uh, separate this out between, say, the next three years and maybe the next ten years because I think the outcomes could be fairly uh, drastic in ten years, but much more gradual in three years that it might not even be perceptible. So, you should seem to be Yeah, this is a very uh, hotly debated topic. Uh, maybe I'll just focus on the near term and provide some context and let the other folks add comments and then uh, you know, we can take it from there. Um, uh, so, you know, Sam Altman, CEO of OpenAI, he, he, he started this tour to meet developers, which has now become a major diplomatic mission, a uh, global diplomatic mission. And uh, from what he said, um, this is uh, one of the top topics, if not uh, the top, it's in the top three topics of every government head that he's met. So just to give you a sense of perspective, this is the number one thing people are talking about. Now, uh, we've been reasonably poor uh, you know, in terms of uh, making projections out into the future. Uh, for example, you know, when the uh, App Store came out in 07, 08, in that time frame, uh, in 07, it would have been very hard to say that the entire taxi industry is going to be completely disrupted because of the App Store. So, you know, our, our ability to make predictions, uh, you know, in terms of what exactly happens is, is, is we don't have a great record there. Um, uh, looking back into the past, you know, let's take one, uh, one technological uh, evolution that we had. I'll just use this example of the introduction of the ATM machine. Uh, so, when the ATM machine uh, was first introduced, uh, again, there was, uh, you can look at the headlines in the newspapers back from the 80s, you know, all the tellers would lose their jobs, and uh, what actually happened was the following. The number of ATM machines grew uh, substantially, uh, but they also brought down the cost of creating new bank branches, right? So the number of bank branches actually increased by 40%. Number of tellers, there was no loss in jobs. The number of jobs, uh, number of tellers were about 500,000 in 2019-95. Uh, I'm just using 1995 as a baseline. And by 2010, there were 550,000 tellers. Uh, but the nature of those jobs had changed significantly. That's really important. And I think that has a kernel of signal in there for, for us that we can extrapolate from. So uh, these were very uh, you know, clerical uh, jobs uh, where you were just focused on tallying currency, right? And they move to more of relationship management jobs, where uh, you're building a relationship with the customer base, you're introducing them to new retail products like a credit card, maybe an auto loan, a home mortgage, maybe a wealth management product. And in today's world, you cannot be a successful teller if you can't do relationship banking. I mean, that's just table stakes. Uh, so I see this as a, a, a really good example of how a job 
uh, transition uh, over time uh, to require additional new skills that one might need uh, to be successful in there. And, and uh, you know, we see this happening for all jobs and all roles with the addition of, uh, uh, you know, this new technology. Uh, you will be required to take on new skills and uh, take on new spheres, and we can talk more about this. Uh, uh, you know, and your role will expand to do more, uh, but at least in the near term, if I'm thinking next 18 months, 24 months, at least I don't see uh, jobs being lost. On the contrary, I see more jobs being created, uh, and the average wages actually going up. And we can we can dig into that. Uh, but this is the headline. Uh, and and uh, you know, GDP actually increasing uh, in, in a big way. Uh, the number of jobs uh, you know, in a given company may go down, but the work that is done across companies and all companies, that is likely to, to increase. And, and finally, we will, we will get productivity. Higher productivity increases than driver high GDP. Um, yeah, maybe I'll add to a few things. One, in the near term, I think maybe next few years, maybe two years, Air will still probably largely be assisted as opposed to replacement. Replacement will happen in aggregate. For example, you might not need 10 people to do the same job. You might need maybe four or five, but it's not going to entirely replace that function, at least for the short term. I think long term is less clear, to be honest. I think you know, it's just the rate at which intelligence is progressing. It's very hard to predict. And I think we as a society are generally pretty hard at predicting the jobs of the future. So I won't predict the jobs of the future. But what I can maybe observe is that the phenomenon of machines being better at humans at a certain thing has always been true, right? Like, today AI is better than humans at chess, but we still watch people playing chess with each other. Um, we've had cars that move from A to B way faster than humans. We still watch people run 100 meter races, right? So, there's something about us as humans that wants to watch and wants to invest and create economy around other people doing things. I don't see that fundamentally changing. Uh, unless the nature of intelligence itself has sort of blends with humanity, that's a much more philosophical discussion. But barring that, I think uh, I think there will always be an economy around humans being interested in doing other things with people. Uh, I'll take two examples, right? Uh, I think the next two to three years, the accessibility and, uh, of this technology is going to really expand, and I'll, I'll take couple of real examples, right? I mean, today, if anybody wants to do data science or AI, first you have to take a one-month course of Python, right? Which itself eliminates 80% of the population. You know, it's, it's a, any, any computer language is not easy to learn for everyone. So that's one thing that's going to change. I feel a lot more people are going to be able to build AI-based applications without need needing to learn Python because now the API has become English or, or a language. Second is on the creative side, right? I mean, I don't know if you guys have seen this, uh, the, the, the Adobe's new product, Firefly. Uh, Photoshop is a great tool. It's also very complex. I mean, I'm a hobby photographer. And it's very, very complex for me to use so far. But what I saw in the demo, I can now use a tool like Photoshop by speaking to it. And I think, imagine the number of people now who can who have creativity and may not have to learn Photoshop, uh, it's just going to expand that skill set uh, across the world. So I think in the immediate term, we'll see a lot more skill sets being, uh, you know, coming to life uh, because technology is becoming significantly easier. Right? So like these guys said, right, maybe for a specific job you need fewer people, but a lot more people will be able to do those kind of jobs. Just, just to add, um, we are seeing AI percolate everywhere, right? I mean, for example, even cities. Madras has become Chen, not AI, right? Chen. Bombay has become more. It's going on. It's going on. It's going on. So, for a person who's actually today, we need to adapt ourselves into how do I make search feel better, right? Applying AI. So I think that skill set and the product mentality is what is going to you know, get us better over time. And I think the more our education system and how we train people and how we adapt ourselves is in that direction, that we'll actually be very successful in every area. It's not just AI for the same AI. I mean, the other sort of broad thing is in the, the history of civilization, one of the things that drives economic output is just productivity improvement. 
And there's very few technologies I've seen that are so broad that just any person in the world should be able to use AI to be more productive. And so in that sense, I feel like it is going to be a huge amplifier of you know, all of our productivity and economic output in the, in the future. Yeah, so what I heard is that um, for the next two to three years, which is what all the panelists here even are mentioning to talk about, um, it's going to be one productivity improvement about accelerating, but not at a great loss of jobs because while the people will rescale or need to sufficiently to work around with these tools, but in an aggregate we will expand the scope of jobs. So won't be too many job losses, but at a 10-year uh, trend, so anybody gets. And take one shot at a profession. So I've been thinking very hard about what would be like a sustainable profession and set of jobs that you know you can argue will grow and, and actually do a lot of. So uh, the one that I interestingly ran into, uh, you know, let's assume, as uh, you must said, you know, in the legal world, uh, the opinion has invested in a company called Harvey that wants to. Uh, you know, uh, give everyone uh, basically a lawyer as an assistant, right? So you, you have an assistant that's a, a pretty uh, a qualified, uh, you know, lawyer. And so what you're doing when you do that, uh, especially in a country like the U.S., is you're taking the bar down, you're taking the friction and the barriers down in what it takes to sue somebody, right? So let's say today we are at one X in terms of the number of court cases that that are uh, that are in all our courts. Uh, so if you take this down by significant amount, you're, you're, it's, it's uh, you know, reasonable to expect, say, uh, an X increase uh, in, in court cases that people will want to file. Uh, let's say, but then the defending party has their own co-pilot AI, right? They have, so they can defend with, uh, with the second and mouse thing. So, so let's say, you know, about 5X of those cases, they mutually agree uh, in arbitration, right? But you still have 5x of the cases that are going to court. Now today we are at 1x, and if you go to 5x, what happens to all the judges? I think it will take a while. I don't know. To be sure, you are judge not here, right? So there goes my idea. But I thought it would, mankind would take a while before they allow for the automated judging of a case. So I thought judges have some extra longevity uh, in that profession, and you're going to need a lot more judges, at least for the foreseeable future. Yeah. So instead of humans and lawyers harassing each other, we will have more electrons harassing even more electrons, <laughs> which is still okay. The Supreme Court needs to be expanded. Yeah, yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Alright, um, so going back to uh, another uh, topic around this whole generating AI. So with a new uh, technology like this, there's going to be a, a, a whole stack that needs to be built out. Uh, around infrastructure, around in this case things like more foundation models, more domain specific models, uh, and even an ecosystem of uh, really tools, uh, new frameworks, new processes uh, for how do you manage these systems, how do you manage these models, and um, uh, even for uh, tools for measuring the value, for measuring, mitigating uh, safety issues and biases. So, uh, what opportunities does this, uh, the, does this new technology open up for uh, entrepreneurs, for founders, and um, and for investors uh, as we as we think about uh, generating? I can start with uh, one thing. But by the way, uh, on the topic of bias, I think it's interesting that like you know there is a lot more attention to the issue of bias in AI in the last several years. It's a good thing, I think we should be thinking about it, but the fact of the matter is humans are pretty biased too and we've been making biased decisions forever. And maybe one of the good things that an outcome that can come out of the AI, uh, the attention on bias in AI is that we can actually measure systems and we can actually improve them, right? Which I see as a really positive sign compared to the state of the world before, right? So just an observation because sometimes people worry that like these things are so much worse than what humans are, but I actually think this could be better than how humans are in terms of our ability to make unbiased decisions. Um, so yeah, and then in terms of opportunities, um, I think it's an interesting question because like uh, one of the fundamental challenges if you are starting a business today with AI is that the intelligence of these foundational systems are increasing every pretty rapidly and if you don't do your job correctly whatever you built 
might be just subsumed by the underlying foundation layer. And I think that's sort of an uneasy position for a lot of startups to be in. And you have to recognize that, right? And so what I've seen actually, even many AI companies that started before the Gen AI wave, all of a sudden, they're figuring out, oh my god, like all the stuff that I built is just very easily replaceable by a single prompt into one of these other models, right? And so that's not an easy place to be. But I would probably say the same advice that maybe people have been giving to founders for ages, which is pick a problem that is going to be long-standing and that you have a deep understanding of, and use AI as an enabler and a technology to solve that problem, right? So the problem isn't going away, it's going to be there for a while. Like let's say you look at things like healthcare, you look at things like education. You know, I don't think these AI models have fundamentally solved these problems. They have a potential to solve these problems. They have a potential to be great um, tools in your aim to solve the problem, but it still requires amazing product building. I think it requires deep domain knowledge, deep empathy of your customers. So I feel like the, the successful startups that deeply last themselves onto a problem that is going to be long-standing and beneficial to humanity of effort, and amazing founders who can use these as great technologies to build great products, I still think there's a fantastic opportunity and lots of them. Um, so I just want to add to that one more thing, right? Um, so data, I'm mentioning about data you know, very, very critically here, but um, you know, if you look at uh, uh, a company that actually wants the solution today, but the biggest value is a recurrent value that comes out. So it's not just one time I saw it, take a bunch of pictures, learn dog or cat and move on, but can this value be repeated? I think you know, even to adding to Sweeney point, if it can be a recurrent the value continues to grow over time, then those opportunities are more likely to uh, be much better from a, uh, from a founder's point of view or, or, or an investor's point of view, right? So I think thinking of that level for the company, how does it benefit, how does it continue to impact the value chain over time is a key in my opinion. Yeah, I, I think uh, one more uh, perspective here is that the LLMs right, or the foundation models, they are a uh, we are one of the artifacts in the entire ecosystem that is needed to build a, build a valuable application using it. it by itself, you know, it, it's, it's, it won't reveal the full value. So, as an example, let's say if you are trying to summarize a document, how do you uh, break that document into pieces, vectorize it, and store it? it? Makes a huge difference in the results that will come out eventually because the LLMs have a limitation today on the amount of data they can process. So you have to smartly know, partition them and do it. So there's a lot of stuff that has to be done before and then after the LLMs respond. You, know, you have to make sure that the response does not have any hallucinations or abusive type of tone, which happens, right? It's a language model. So I think there's a whole opportunity around building uh, the tool sets and the ecosystem, uh, you know, the stack itself to, to use these LLMs and partitions models effectively. I think and that's where a lot of the value creation will happen. And then eventually the apps that will be built on top of that, will, you know, which will hopefully reveal their business value. So I think that's where a lot of opportunity is. Yeah, I can just very quickly summarize the, the investment stack, the way we look at it. Uh, I won't go into a lot of detail, happy to take Q&A. But you know, at the lowest layer, you can think of the AI core layer. So that's where you have, uh, you know, semiconductor chips. You know, you're, there's a lot of uh, active investments going on on new chipsets uh, for, for this new world. Uh, hardware accelerators. There are the foundation models. Uh, there are, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, other types of uh, model deployment technologies uh, and related technologies that was just discussed. So you know, there's uh, vector databases. There's model ops, there's, uh, you know, prompt engineering, whole host of things. It's all in that AI core there. There's, there's a lot going on there, lots of companies, uh, lots of uh, interesting stuff. And, uh, you know, new segments are emerging, like agent frameworks and orchestration, and they're still actively being built. Uh, on top of that, I think of, uh, you know, tools and services layer. So the tools and services, you can think of, you know, search as, uh, you know, an example, uh, knowledge management, reporting and, and analytics, uh, you know, different types of other like consumerish services around text generation, narratives, uh, summarization, sentiment analysis, things of that nature. Uh, audio, uh, you know, there's transcription, there's synthetic voice, there's music, uh, there's uh, media editing uh, for video, uh, audio and images, uh, and so on and so forth. There's a whole slew of tools and services. 
Then uh, you can think of another layer on top, which is the what I think of as horizontal applications. And so these are function-specific applications, customer service and support, sales, marketing, product development, procurement, finance, HR, IT, so on and so forth. Uh, and then you have the vertical apps on top, so specifically within healthcare, like clinical assessments, medical diagnosis, within legal, uh, within financial services, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So there's all of these different areas. There's a lot of activity happening in the bottom two uh, layers of the stack, but a, a lot is catching up in the top two as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jinnipan. Yeah, we did. We get to the audience Q&A. Uh, just we, about. I think we have about 10 minutes, so I would request all people to speak now for the 30 seconds, whether it's a question or a comment, and then maybe one of them can answer. So it's good. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, my question is, you talked about bias. In legal parlance or in a court case, judges always caution lawyers, don't ask a leading question. A leading question is a question that kind of prompts the kind of answer that you'd like to hear. And, and that's not allowed legally, by the way. I mean, that's, judges always make the correction. How do you make that correction in a chat GPT kind of system where a person asks a very neutral question and then seeks the answer. And second one is a suggestion. If you have a good insert generating software, you can send it to Donald Trump for watching. That's 30 seconds. Sorry, what are the second questions? The second one is if you, if you can develop a good insert generating software, you could send it to Donald Trump for a portion. Uh, I thought he only had it. <laughs> So is the question, how do you interface with them so that they don't give you back bias chances? Is yeah, I mean, how do you ask a question where you expect to generate an answer or how to prompt something where you expect to produce something, but it is asked from a very neutral point of view. It's not asked from a and Now, you can say, what is the color? Or you could say, what's the color red? You know what I mean? There is a difference between the two. This is where in court, the judges say you must ask a neutral question, not a leading question. So training the prompter to ask yeah. the right question. I mean, I think you might, my sense is you, there might be products that sort of will be built as a layer above the language model that uh, conform to the, the specific industry and the regulations and the rules in that industry and they are able to guide the underlying technology to be able to, so that the interface is more well developed, right? So, uh, I think it's just going to get de developed as a layer above. Yeah, I've seen some recent startups looking at building products that manage prompts that help the user to guide the right prompts to ask. Uh, a lot of this, I think, is mostly through iterative testing. So I don't think we are going to take any new technologies, but uh, we do figure out how to ask the questions to elicit better answers from so I had a question, uh, maybe similar in the main on the bias um, point, Shrinivas. On you know when you have humans and we know that um, we are biased, there are sort of these techniques that you're trying to lead people to improve themselves, right? So which is we carry this view of this is how the world works today, and this is the way we would like the world to work in the future, and you use sort of persuasion or empathy to get to that point. What is the mechanism for AI to get there? Like today, it's trained on the world as it exists today, and all the biases it's trained on are embedded in it. And so, if you want it to actually get unbiased or debiased, what is sort of the intellectual process it goes through to get to a better state? Want me to take it? Yeah, I mean, I think it's again codifying what your reward is. Uh, and the way a lot of these AI systems learn is through provision of examples and through a reward mechanism that they can learn from. So actually I'm very optimistic that the, the biases can be codified, they can be systemized, the reward functions can be expressed in very objective terms and that should allow us to build AI systems that are less biased. One of the hard parts about being humans is that we don't have language to actually codify this and talk about it, right? So the more easily you can codify it, you can be more objective about it. 
I think there's been some, uh, just to add, uh, there's some recent work coming out of another company, not OpenAI, uh, but Anthropic, that's uh, adopted a slightly different approach, which is they've taken a bunch of principles that are codified in UN, different UN chapters. Uh, and for data privacy, I think they've even taken the Apple's terms of service, right? Thou shalt not reveal any personal data or biases, etc. And they're trying to um, uh, uh, match the models to be more and more compliant with these principles. Now, will they ever be able to codify all of human values as principles? I don't think so, but will we get progressively better and more so. Yeah, actually, that's a, that's a really good point. So, if you look at the, there's an emerging trend in uh, getting better outputs from language models, is to actually ask the model some of these questions itself. Like, let's say it produces an output, you can interrogate the model and say, is your answer biased? Are you being racist? And it's amazing, actually, in many cases, it, it tells you whether it is, <laughs> it's biased or it is racist. Uh, and you can ask it to correct itself. Now, it's not entirely foolproof, but it gives you promise of actually a self-correcting mechanism, which is pretty foundational. Um, yeah, you guys. A great panel. So, uh, my question, and I think uh, the first state uh, thesis here, right, that's more than anybody gets. Uh, uh, one of the things I think is probably going to happen is you have tens of thousands of existing enterprise applications, right? And a lot of the technology providers of these apps into the enterprise are going to face a lot of pressure to introduce AI capabilities, let's say, what they're already offering. But one of the challenges is going to be they have a ton of, let's say, proprietary data. Then they go to these customers, they have a ton of proprietary data. And then they want to incorporate this AI technology, say, from other third parties. I'm really curious to hear about, I feel like it's like wild, wild west, you know, no rules, no regulations, a lot of concern, fear, uncertainty, doubt among both the vendors and the customers around data governance. Are these guys going to play by the rules? Are they going to take my proprietary data, incorporate it into what they do, make it freely, widely available? Can you guys speak to that particular issue or challenge? Meaning, who's kind of going to help break through that? Because I think it's a big logjam right now in terms of adoption. That nobody trusts anybody else that their data is going to be safe and secure. So I'll start there. Yeah, let me, um, let me touch on that. The way we have seen is, A, whoever owns the data literally should control what should happen to it. I think most of the regulations that we see, including GDPR, um, you know, it gives control to, I mean, in the case of enterprise side, for the uh, enterprise to decide what they want to do. Having said that, they can decide how and who can use this. And one of the stuff we see with synthetic data is, if you want to share data that is privacy compliant, you can actually create a version of it that looks somewhat similar, captures the essence of it, while maintaining you know, any level of privacy that you need or any differentiation that you need, right? So there are tools today that are available that kind of make your data to one extreme is exactly the same, other extreme completely different, and everything in between that you can design with. So, and you as a owner of the data can control and should be able to control how you use it. I don't believe, it's all theoretical, I don't believe there's anything real that you can rely on. Right. It's all GDPR, CCP, all that's wonderful, nice, wonderful. It's all paper, right, contract, right? Enforcement and real control, I think, is a real issue, but I'm curious to hear about this. Okay. Especially with large data sets or proprietary data sets that maybe a vendor owns or the customer owns. And then trusting some third party to come along and make sure they don't lose their competitive edge along the way. Okay. At the end of the day, I think large enterprises have a selfish interest to play by the rules. Okay. Uh, you are right that those systems are still evolving. The auditability is still evolving. Uh, even not just the use of the data, right, but even how do you apply the data. Where do you use the AI for? Who holds the liability if something goes wrong? Or is it the foundation model provider? Is it the person who fine tunes it? Is it the person who's embedding it into the application? I think that is still getting fixed up. And I think uh, even last week, the EU, I think, uh, passed a EU AI Act regulation. It's still not yet become a, become a full fledged law, but it's a regulation. 
So I think some of that ecosystem is still working. But I do believe that it's not a wild west. It certainly won't become a wild west because most companies won't be able to try and capture any value if it becomes a wild west. So I think it's in a sense in their vested interest to make sure they play by the rules, have some auditability on top of it, and, and, and clearly communicate to their users. Uh, I think OpenAI yeah, in some sense did something. Yeah, I think just, I mean, I would, my recommendation is look at the terms of service for any product that you're using and uh, read what they tell you about how the data is used. For example, for OpenAI, we tell all our enterprise customers that we don't use their data for training. We don't. Uh, we do train on a completely different data set, but for enterprise customers, there's a very clear contract with us that their, their data is not used for training. And I, I think most people will, I mean, they'll find some versions of it, right? So. Uh, yeah, I think there's probably more uncertainty and fear than the reality actually. But I, I do believe you're bringing up an important point, and we've had a lot of discussions on this with, with legal counsel as well, uh, including policy makers. So right now, the US, at least, it's in a legal mind for you as it relates to uh, copyright and data privacy and th things of that nature. Fundamentally, the statutory framework in the US is very limited for data. Data is not treated as intellectual property today in the US, and that is causing a whole lot of downstream, all the issues that you described. Today, the protections you get for data are very limited. They're just copyright-driven protections. And so the only alternative is to uh, depend on contract law. There's no other regulatory or statutory uh, you know, directive uh, as it relates to data. And so when you go down to contract law, it comes down to terms of service, and you know, that's what's going to define how the data gets used. Uh, and, and so we need to strengthen that. Remember, there's a lot of discussion in DC right now on exactly this topic. And Jenny has actually uh, you know, brought this to the forefront. I think I agree with you on the public data, right? That's where there is a, there's a question on copyright and what is the, what is allowed or not. But I'm talking also about private enterprise data. I think the framework there is fairly clear. And well, it depends on contract law. It, yes. Data is, can't be treated as a, as a, you know, uh, as intellectual property. That there's a, and, but data, what is interesting, if you go behind these algorithms, it is the data that is creating these systems. Uh, oh, thank you. Can I, can I, no. Um, in the interest of time, I have a request. If you have not asked a question today in any earlier panel, please step up. If you've already done that, please give others a chance. Thank you very much for understanding. Okay, uh, my name is uh, Sashi, I'm uh, 2007 batch one. Uh, so I have a question on the security, right? Like security on the web is pretty mature with OWASP and other things handling that. How about security on the model side? Uh, how about model poisoning and things like that? Is there anything happening around that area? Is there uh, any scope for innovation there? Happy to go, yeah. No, yeah, it is definitely an active area of research. I think one of the, obviously you have seen this, like, you know, the there are people who are very creative with prompts, and they try to get the models to say very, very interesting things that may not be kosher. So that is obviously a completely new security vector, right? So, and that we have to understand a lot more. We have to build systems to deal with that. So, yeah, certainly uh, it creates new interesting opportunities. I think for uh, one of the challenges with open source is also that um, you know how, in what it's both a blessing and a curse, right? So obviously when the models are out there, you can understand them, you can see what exactly is going on. But there will also be people who could take them and sort of maybe modify them in ways that you're not sure about. So I think treating it as a black box and understanding how what the boundaries of the systems are and how do you get them to produce what you want and not go astray is definitely a completely new. Basic layman kind of question. Um, in three points. One is what's the easiest way to keep track of it? I can't go to ten different platforms and figure out what is happening. So what 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 do you think is a simple way that we can keep track of what's happening? What is pretty new? And then second thing is one question. One question. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So, uh, 
I think uh, what's happening in the generative AI world is crazy. I mean, even for uh, you know, I, I'm a techie, I think it's difficult to keep following all the day-to-day -day innovation. I think I think that's true for everyone. Um, you know, just being aware of what's going on is uh, you know one way to sort of keep you know reading the news and uh, research papers that are coming out uh, of companies like Meta and Opinia and Google and other stuff. Those are the ones that are now driving some of the action because the paper comes out and then people start implementing stuff around it. So I think uh, it is moving very fast. It will settle down, I hope, in the next few months. But it is true that you know there's a lot of stuff. It's uh, I'm already seeing a change from I think last two months to now. Uh, it's you know fewer fewer and more stable models are coming out. So uh, yeah, just sort of try to get your head around the pattern and uh, don't focus too much on each individual stuff, right? I think that, that's the way to uh, keep it sane for them. That's, that's what it is. Okay, thanks. <laughs> so the so main uh, question, I learned uh, about the question from Yarika, and then we will meet up first with Yarika, then we will wrap it up. Okay. Alright, thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Vida Patil, I'm a podcaster. Um, I'm writing a book with uh, some IITs uh, on startups and uh, when I was researching with MIT Media Lab on AI, uh, there was a law of accelerating returns they talked about any sufficiently uh, dazzling technology like AI or Gen AI, it looks like it's speeding up but something will come and slow it down. Like in microprocessors when lots of chips were getting compressed in a small space, power constraints and uh, efficiency of the chips became a constraint. So uh, it kind of slows things down. Something like Gen AI, which is like a boom right now, something will come and slow it down. We heard like privacy issues, security issues uh, could slow it down. Bias issues could slow it down. What do you think are the accelerating slowing factors which will slow down the Gen AI bubble? What do you think? Will, what do you think this is a bubble? Will it slow down? I just can answer, but I think one of the short term answers is going to be cost of implementing these solutions. Uh, the foundation models are not cheap today, the com computing around them is uh, expensive. It's, it's becoming cheaper, but uh, you know it, it is going to be prohibitively expensive as we scale. Uh, so that's going to be one factor for sure, but over time that's going to become cheaper. Uh, that would be other factor. I'll just uh, add a quick comment. So there are multiple facets of slowdown, right? So there's the, the R&D and the core development of the technology. So that's on a train, and at least from everything I've heard, and you must correct me, uh, there's going to be foreseeable gains, uh, the foreseeable future that we can see that this transformer model platform that we have can, can you know, deliver higher degrees of intelligence. Uh, on the adoption side, to your point, yes, there can be regulations, there can be a whole host of things that can, that can uh, you know, uh, throttle the rate at which this is adopted. Fantastic. I just want to add that Elon Musk tried to slow it down. Yes. Right? He said yes. six months. <laughs> uh, yes. It didn't work, uh, yes. thankfully. Yes. So, uh, but I think, I think uh, fundamentally, uh, like for example, some of the models that we have tried, the model performance itself will actually tell us whether we want to pursue that or not. Right? Right. So in a way, um, it's, 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 it's kind of the technology plus economic decisions coming together. And that will actually help us go in the right direction. But all indications today are we are at that inflection point of efficiency game. So it's at that beautiful time. You know. Early stages. Yeah, I mean, Early stages. So fast, if you look at even OpenAI, I think just in the last six months they have they have uh, uh, reduced the costs by almost an order of magnitude. Right? It's not even Moore's law. It's going way faster than even Moore's law. To me, at least, when we talk to startups, the main uh, uh, threat today seems to be more about how fast can uh, NVIDIA manufacture more chips. <laughs> right. seems to be the more fundamental limitation than even any of the uh, Gen AI technology costs itself. So at least for the next uh, couple of years, I would, I would expect that there is no real, uh, real uh, single factor for slowing down. Right. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm Nihanka, I'm from the 2020 batch and I'm doing my PhD on life physics. My question is, do you really think we can use generative AI to move from the abstraction level programming 
to play in English because that is a claim that people make that it democratizes application and software development. But I feel like learning how to code in Python, the rules are deterministic, but prompt generation is more of an empirical study. Uh, besides, you need to have a really algorithmically thinking brain to write the prompt in English. I don't know if that education is that much more democratic than learning from a code. Yeah, I don't think it's going to fully replace uh, you know, the need for coding. I mean, there'll be a set of people, researchers, uh, you know, and people who are writing core software, they will still need to write software. But uh, I think the point is that a lot more people who have that uh, you know, logical thinking in their brain but may not know how to code can now start using it. I think that's so, so it's more around democratizing it, not eliminating it. I think what uh, Neva said, right, uh, uh, the use of a co-pilot, right, which is, uh, it's going to accelerate coding as well, like programming. Uh, it's not going to help us think of the logic. The logic has to come from us, which is true for the prompt as well. But it's going to accelerate how you, how, how fast you can generate uh, the code. So I think in the short term, at least, you know, in the next few years, it's, it's going to be all about productivity gains. Right. But for the consumer right, of, of these applications, the interface is now going to be English because the technologists will make it work, uh, you know, put in the hard work to make that English interpretable. Uh, for example, you know, you don't have to write SQL query to access data, that kind of stuff. Right? So that's, that's a relatively, I would say, simple application of these kind of technologies which will help more and more people use uh, use the fundamental thing. Same, same example as Photoshop that I did here, right? You don't have to learn each menu item and you know what option to set. You just tell it to do something and then do it. Actually, to end on a provocative note, I'll, I'll slightly differ from my panelist here. So, Srinivas is a Nokoli, as a guy called Andre Karpathi at OpenAI, right? He's uh, been espousing uh, software to Dodo. He first came up with a blog about it in 2017, 2018. Everyone laughed at him. He was derided on Twitter, made fun of him. Nobody's making fun of him anymore. And, and if you see his tweets, he's actually said English is the new programming language. And I don't think it will take a few years. Uh, I think you know, even uh, in months. You're talking months, where uh, you know you're going to have prompt-based uh, code generation, and, and the role will shift to more of uh, you know uh, synthesizing all this code that can be generated across different prompts to build systems very quickly. In fact, some of the thought leaders are talking about disposable software and other trends that are going to come in uh, very shortly. We're talking about the medium term price. With that, I'd like to thank this panel. I think they have it's one of those topics that's probably on everybody's mind and uh, there's concerns, there's hopes, there is, you know, expectation so i'm guessing that there are going to be a lot more talks we will definitely have more of these type of sessions i think there are many interested groups i thank all the panelists for giving their time and their knowledge today and uh, thank you very much